Thank you for joining me on the Investing for Freedom podcast. Today, I have a special guest, and I know I say that all the time, but honestly, our guest today, and I don't think I've ever even told him this, but he's just such an inspiring human. And I'm really excited to just be able to bring uh, Mike Chu to you guys, because not only is he inspiring when it comes to business and relationships and just impact, and we're going to get into all of that, but just as an individual, I mean, this is the guy that like, I go out of my way to like, we went to dinner a while back and I just want to be around him. And I just want to, you know, pick his brain and feel his energy. And, you know, some of you may have never even heard of Mike Chu. I hadn't heard of Mike Chu, you know, until maybe a year ago. And then as fate would have it, a good friend of mine was posting about what an amazing human Mike Chu was. And then I got invited to a dinner with, you know, a small group of couples and there's Mike Chu sitting across from me. And I'm like, okay, the universe wants me to know this guy. And I'm just so blessed to know you, man. So I'm also blessed and honored that you would come and speak to my community. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And thanks for that intro. It's funny you say um, what you said during the intro. Uh, I'm, I've been on a handful of shows and uh, this was one I was really looking forward to because of the the amount of uh, the amount I enjoyed just spending time with you and the conversation. So really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Well, let's dive into it. So the four questions that we always start with. So hmm. if narrow it down to one thing that has had the greatest impact on your success. What would that be? Yeah. I, when I, when I think of that question, it's hard to narrow it down to just one, <laughs> but, but um, the one that I would go back to is I started karate when I was three years old. Uh, I think the karate school that I went to didn't even take kids until they were five or seven, if I remember correctly. And I was badgering my parents so much to want to start karate at, at three that my mom walked in and was like, you, you have to take my son. And so they let me start at three years old. And wow. I, I, I've been in the martial arts now uh, for 30 something years. And so uh, that has been foundational for me in so many different ways. And I think whether someone knows martial arts or karate or not, they would probably think of things like discipline and hard work at first. And those things definitely have played a major role, but especially talking about business and like success being on the more monetary and business side, I've looked back at how karate has, and it has had an impact for me in the business and success world now, really more because of two things. And that is process and patience. Mm. And I think a lot of times people would be more successful at just about anything that they chose to pursue in life if they just stuck with it at a high commitment level for a longer horizon period of time. But especially in this generation, so many people want the flashy, shiny new object and don't just stick, whether it's an investment for a long period of time or a business for a longer period of time. Karate at an early, early age, because there are many times I wanted to quit. There are many times I got bored. There are many times I was like, this isn't fun anymore. Uh, but it taught me the commitment to the process of getting better a little bit every day mm. for a long enough period of time and being patient to see the result uh, that you would get out of that. So karate has um, been an incredibly foundational part of my life. You know, I, I love that. And I love, I've actually been pondering this a lot lately because you know, one of my mentors always and I think we've all probably heard this saying, but you know, like Mike's an overnight success, 20 years in the making. And it's sure. like, you know, I think last time we were together, we were talking about Alex Hermosi, who I didn't know who Alex was like eight or nine months ago. And now he's like sure. everywhere, right? Everywhere. And you think all of a sudden, like Alex just became successful. But the reality is like, I love that you go back to that because, you know, it doesn't matter what it is that you're doing. It's showing up and that mm -hmm. patience and, and, and keep on showing. I've been thinking about this because we live in, you said, especially in this day and age, we live in a world where you know, everything's on social media and it's right in front of us. I mean, even this, the podcast, if you're listening to it, you're watching it somewhere, sure. um, you know, you think that like, oh, where I, maybe somebody just started listening to the show like a couple of weeks ago and they think that, you know, we've, we've just arrived in the last couple of weeks or whatever. And sure. the reality is it's like that patience piece of it. I just love that because, and there's so many people too, when you think about martial arts, I'd love that you go back to that because um, Chet Holmes was one of my greatest, like early, uh, mentors from afar. I didn't know him personally, but that's the thing mm. that he was talked about too, was that mm. he called, he talked, he called it pig headed discipline. Mm. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Yes. I've never, I've never heard it put that way, but that's why, you know, when I was sharing my answer is like, I think some people would naturally think of discipline, but pig headed discipline. I never, well, I never heard it that way is really more what I was referring to because, you know, even at six years old. I got to the point where I had earned all the belts that you can earn in three to six months. And I, you know, I went to a pretty traditional karate school, not your McDojo, so to speak, where they're just giving you belts to keep getting you to pay. It got to the point as early as five, six, seven years old, where I had to wait 
12, 18 or 24 months before they would let me test for my new belt. And so that meant a year or two as a six-year-old of showing up to class two to three to four days a week, just doing the same damn punch or kick over and over and over again until they felt like you were good enough or ready to test for the next level. I mean, shoot, you know, there's times at 36 years old where I'm like, I don't know if I want to be that patient, yeah. but, you know, le learning that at six and eight and 10 pig headed discipline. I never heard it that way, but I really like that. Yeah, no, I think it's just sage advice. You know, sometimes, uh, and, and Chet Holmes actually said this, he said, you know, the thing that he learned. And, and again, I, I think, uh, you martial arts guys just that there's so much to learn from it, but yeah, you know, he always said, it's not about doing 10,000 different kicks one time. It's about doing the same move. Yeah over and over and over 10,000 times until you perfect it. Yeah. Yeah. And when I got into business, at first I didn't think karate would, I remember my mom asked me because I took karate with my brother, my sister, my mom, and my dad were all black belts. My mom owns the karate school that we grew up in now. So we went there as a three-year-old, she owns the school today. So it's kind of a cool story to come full circle. Um, but I remember when I got into business and none of my, not a lot of my family were entrepreneurs or business or in sales or anything like that. My mom's a teacher, my, my mom and dad's parents on both sides were farmers. So I guess they were kind of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs in that sense. But I remember asking her asking if I thought karate would play a part in success. And at first I said, no, mm -hmm. I was like, I don't really, I don't understand how it would, but yeah. In, in hindsight now that whole Bruce Lee quote, if it's not about learning 10,000 things mm -hmm. and, you know, you referencing Alex Ramosi, it's like, there's so many things we could focus on, but if most of us just focused on less things more effectively, for long enough periods of time to master whether it's sales skills, whether it's what type of investments to get into. Like there's, I remember in my late twenties, I remember losing money in a, a bunch of investments because I was just chasing all the flashy investments instead of really sticking to a, like a sound investment, fundamental, like core set of beliefs. Um, and so I, I go back to that, that, that quote that you're referring to instead of practicing one kick 10,000 times to mastery. Mm, I love it. Yeah. I was, do you know who John Gordon is? He wrote the energy bus, yeah, the energy bus. And he just had the book, the playbook come out. I read uh, this summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sometimes, you know, you, you get in a room and you're like, how in the heck did I get here? But um, I'm, I joined this group, uh, Pete Vargas is head of, it's called the wellspring and I, oh, cool. I, with Justin Donald and uh, yeah. pod it's, a, you know, we break out into small groups and and I'm in there with Pete and some of some of the other guys. Well, John Gordon joined our pod. And so we're like in this group of like seven That's people, awesome. John's in there, but this is the reason why I was saying this. He made a comment last week. I didn't even know he's going to be in our pod and he's there like hanging out and teaching us. And that's great he comment. He said, if the devil can't make you bad, meaning, you know, lose your way, throw you off your game, whatever, mm. he'll make you busy. Mm. The devil can't make you bad. He'll make you busy. And when you're saying that too, it's like, you know, the distraction and doing multiple things and not focusing. And you just, you came back to that process and patience. Yeah. I just love that that yeah. with, and, you know, I've been struggling with, I have too much on my plate right now. Like I'm, I'm, sure. I'm doing a lot of things like mediocre and doing nothing great. I feel like right now. And so I've just Man. been hearing that the last few weeks, like, you know, and I feel like every time it's, it's that glass ceiling, right. It's that lid that we get to. And then we have to kind of go back to that process. What's the process yep. like, and, and how do we take certain things off? But when he said that the other day, the devil can't make you bad. He'll make you busy. I'm like, Oh, hit me right it's between the eyes because it's just so different. good. Right. It's so good. I had heard a mentor say it busyness is not the same thing as creating business and relating to you. Like I felt like in the middle of the year, I bought a couple businesses last year, business was growing and, you know, middle quarter two, I was like, nothing's moving. I'm doing a lot. <laughs> I'm doing a lot. Nothing's growing. Nothing's moving. And uh, quarter three was a refreshing quarter for me. I don't, whenever people are watching this, it's late September, we're, we're filming this and quarter three was a refreshing quarter for me. And really going back to what you said, the biggest thing that changed is I evaluated and audited my time of where I was staying busy because it's just what I had done for the last 12 or 24 months, but really audited and evaluated. Is this the highest priority thing that moves the needle right now? And there were so many things that the answer was no, but I was just used to doing them. And all I shifted after that, this worked for me. I'm not saying this is advice for everyone, but it just felt really good in this moment. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I just cleared both mornings from seven to noon. And I know this is a typical deep work like tip, but doesn't mean I always implemented it. Doesn't mean I was always living it. I was taking a 10 a.m. call sometimes or an 8 a.m. call. And Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, pretty religiously right now for all a quarter three, just open space to work on whatever is the actual highest priority thing in that moment. And 
quarter three felt like things really started to unlock again. And uh, it was, it was that little shift. So I relate to that for sure. I love it. Karen was just telling me the other day, she was on a call with a, a, a friend of hers or something. And they were talking about, she was, you know, and as entrepreneurs, like we're visionaries, right. And we like yeah. birth these ideas and we go through all this, it, it's like birthing. It's like, it's painful <laughs> sometimes. And yeah. uh, I don't know what that's like, but that's, that was the correlation there. Um, <laughs> For sure. The thing that her friend was talking about is like, sometimes when you get to this point that we're talking about where, you know, we've got, we've taken on too much. Mm. And this was like a, this was a very like forward statement, but she said, sometimes you have to kill your children. And I was like, Whoa, that's like a, and, and she's like, you know, literally you spend all this time, like birthing these ideas and and going through it. And sometimes it's just at the point where, you know, these ideas are dead, it's time to move on. And yeah. that's a very, very painful, like process. Yeah. <laughs> the killing your children part sounds extreme. So I had heard it. I had heard a similar analogy of like, uh, was it shoot the horse behind the barn? Like I'd heard it, but that way, then again, for the animal lovers, kid lovers, that probably is not as good of an analogy either, yeah. but same concept of like, what do you need to put to rest right now? Because um, a lesson I learned two years ago in the middle of COVID is that a lot of times when we're birthing a new season of our life, or when we're birthing a new identity or version of ourselves for something to be birthed, oftentimes we also have to grieve mm. the death or loss of something before we can create space for something new. A lot of times we just, especially as entrepreneurs and achievers, we just want to keep stacking more and more and more and more. But the reality is, I know you're moving right now. Sometimes you have to clear space to move new things in. And sometimes it's hard for people um, to, to, to do two things. One, the emotional side and actually like grieve and put things to rest. And then focus wise, like on the mentality side, a little tip that I started two years ago that has really helped me stay focused as an entrepreneur is I have a weekly like priority list I do every week and I have a monthly priority list. Mm -hmm. I just added the simple words next week and next month at the bottom. So anytime I have a new idea and I want to go add it to this week's list, I'm like, no, that's just not priority for this week. I add it to that. Or if I want to add it to this month's priority, I'm like, nope, actually at the bottom of the month when it says next month or next quarter. And I'll just, no, nope, not going to focus on that. I'll, I'll revisit that next quarter and allowing myself space to not forget the really good idea, but not try to do every good idea right now. Uh, that is, that's, that's been game changer for me around feeling like I have too much on my plate sometimes as well. Man, that is just powerful. Like I, I take notes of clips and that's a clip. That's a clip we yeah. need there. Cause I think, I mean, we've already we could end right now and it'd be an amazing <laughs> thing, but that's a practical tool. I was just thinking about it. When you look at my Evernote, there's, there's like 300 years of ideas in my Evernote. There's no way that I could like, I can't even find half of them, even if I wanted to. And so like, that's a really great like prioritization tool. So I appreciate that. You yeah, know, you said great. something, we're still on question one, which I think is awesome. <laughs> I, I have to have you back for an episode two at some point. For sure. You said something though about like that dying. And we were just at the couples mastermind in Miami last week. And one thing that I've, I'd, I'd love to share this and then get your take on it. Yeah. One thing that I've really been thinking about a lot um, when we talk about, you were, you were talking about moving into that new season or that new thing. And sometimes something has to die. I've struggled with this, you know, the last, really the last like six months, it's become clear to me, but the last year and a half, two years, I've really struggled with this internally. And I think you and I might've talked about this, but the last 20 years of my life, everything that we've done, investing for freedom exists because I wanted to be that present father. I didn't want yeah. to, you know, be distracted and not be with my children. And I wanted my children to see the world. And, you know, now they're older. Dylan's 22, Tim's 20, Caitlin's 18. But I kind of struggled with that transition. And what I'm yeah. realizing too, is that the things that I worked so hard to build, those bumpers, those boundaries, those non-negotiables, you know, the, my, my version of me and my identity, like we're kind of in this new zone and and I keep going back to, you know, we always talk about limiting beliefs, but the thing yeah. about it is those were not limiting beliefs. Those were empowering Empower. beliefs, empowering processes and boundaries that I created. And so it was awesome. And we accomplished, you know, I don't want to say it was perfect, but, but sure. we did well along the way. And we've been having this conversation because when you enter a new zone or a new period of time, and when you were talking about that death. I have to, that version of me, there was nothing wrong with that. It was great. There was no limiting beliefs in any of that, but sometimes like good versions of yourself have to die too, because like, I'm ready to kind of take on the world now. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to get overloaded and overwhelmed and I need to balance that. But really I keep finding myself, Kara, Kara pointed this out. I keep finding myself going back to an extreme. No. Mm. And like, sometimes I'm like, 
why, why can't I go? My default was no, I can't go to dinner. No, I can't hang out with you. No, I can't because I want to be home for dinner with my children and every, and I'm kind of like in a season of yes for certain things. Mm -hmm. I mean, to what, to what you're saying. And I, while I don't have adult children, you know, talking about the, the loss part for at least just relating to my own story, like why 2020 was beautiful and challenging at the same time is because what I learned during that season is oftentimes the identity or season that we're grieving is sometimes a season that we really loved. Mm. Like, for example, I knew there was a point where me and you talked about this, like the benefits and impacts of alcohol. And I made a decision three and a half years ago that I just was a non-drinker. I was, but that was actually kind of the act of not drinking actually was not the hard part. The hard part was the emotional part of putting to bed the fun fraternity boy or, 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 or the connections and experiences that I had created, you know, oftentimes with a great bottle of wine or, or you know, at a party or drinking. And then there was this whole identity that it felt like I was putting to rest when I made that decision. And it's not that I was, I, it's not that I hated that version of myself. There was a lot of great memories that came with it. And that's why I think the word grieving instead of just dying is the word I, I like to use when talking about transitioning identities. Cause it's not like that identity just dies. Sometimes we really are grieving mm -hmm. the love that we have for that chapter. In your case, maybe Mike, you're referring to like, you really love the chapter of like creating presence and freedom as parents, you know, so you can be the dad that you wanted to be. And as that chapter transitions, you loved it. So it's not like you actually want to let go of it. It's not like it's it was limiting beliefs. It's not like it wasn't serving you. Yeah. But yet life moves on and we kind of are forced to have to grieve transition sometimes. And that emotional piece was uh, a lesson that I had to learn multiple times over the last five years, especially um, as I've grown over the last couple of years. I, I love it. I love uh, just coming back to the identity conversation. And, you know, I, this, you and I've talked about alcohol a lot just because, um, and it's not, I, what I love about you is that it, it it's about nobody, but you. Yeah. So this, yeah. You're not like one that's, you know, you're not on the, uh, you know, the 12 step train or like trying to, you know, save me or it's, it, you made a decision in your world. Yeah. And so, and the reason why I point that out is because I've been toying with the idea of like, I'm not a drinker, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, um, and I haven't actually had a drink for, uh, well, it's been 29 days. Um, it's awesome. it's yeah, because, you know, I've been, I've been slowing down and I, I listened to, um, we listened to a podcast on alcohol. I've just been thinking about, yeah. and I'd love to get into the mindset piece with you around this a little bit. I've been thinking about, you know, what does a high performer, what does a high performing mic look like in a clear headed mic? And, you know, honestly, yeah. half the time, I don't even know the last, you know, five or 10 years. I don't even know what a month straight looks like of Mike being clear headed. And the thing that I realized, you know, watching my whoop band and, and not yeah. drinking for a few days and um, it takes three or four days to even start feeling decent. Sure. Sure. I don't know the science of it all. I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the uh, Huberman Huberman yeah. Yeah, yeah. podcast that came out recently. That one got pretty popular. I, I didn't make the decision because I'm some like science expert on those things. But uh, to to what you're referring to, there is for me, and I don't know if this is necessarily what you were asking, but like around the the the, the champion's mindset and the best version of self. First of all, I believe that I had a mentor say this to me that we create our lives to the level of our identity, not mm -hmm. our, not our work ethic, not like who we believe we are dictates so much of our expectations and using drinking as an analogy, for example, there's many people that are like, I'm not drinking for a while, or I'm not smoking for a while or whatever it is, but they're referring to the habit. Mm -hmm. They're referring to the action. And very often I was this person for 10 years. We see that person drinking again or smoking a cigarette or whatever it is, three weeks, three months, three years later. And I remember my mentor said this, he said, um, when people actually start to make a change and level up in their life is when they stop talking about just the habit, but the identity that they're going to step into the analogy or the examples. He said, instead of, I'm just, I, I just don't smoke anymore. It's I am a non-smoker mm. or I don't drink anymore versus I am a non, uh, a non-drinker. Mm -hmm. And when we, I, when we, when we relate to that identity, things start to level up that accelerated paces, it feels like. So the first part for me was, I felt like I was oftentimes out of integrity or a hypocrite with who I was saying I wanted to be, 
Mm. and the actions and behaviors and energy and ways of being when I drank. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first reason. And then secondly, like peak performance of Mike, you're, you're saying, referring to you and, and then, or uh, me, once we get clear on who that version of us is, it's like, what is that? How does that person make us feel when we're around them? How does that person think? What are that person's habits and all that type of stuff? And for me, it came down to three things. And that was the energy of that person. Like when you're just around someone that you just like, you feed off their energy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Tony Robbins talks about like the state, like the, the physical state of that person and the mindset or focus of that person. And when I evaluated the impacts of alcohol and all three of those things, especially as we get older, <laughs> like a, a hangover can last a week. Sometimes it feels like, oh. you know, and we can still feel the impacts in the gym or by, by Friday of that last Saturday, um, I saw the impact not only on the identity of who I wanted to be, but then more tangibly with my energy, my state and uh, my actual focus or mindset. So yeah, that decision's been uh, impactful. And like you said, I'm not the person shouting at the rooftop. Everybody should stop drinking. Want yeah. You can't be successful if you drink wine. That's just not true. Right. It just was true for me at that season to be the best version of myself and in alignment with who I said I wanted to be. Um, it was true and right for me, I think is the better way to say it. You know, one thing, and I think I mentioned this to you a while back, but I've been just sitting with this idea for a while because, and then uh, Huberman said it, uh, he, he turned it into science for me, but I, let's so not like drop dead you know drunk you're you're drinking too much etc but even when i go out and i just have you know two or three glasses of wine and you sure. maybe a bourbon or whatever and i found myself so number one i love going out to dinner with people like you and having you know deep yeah. conversations connections etc but i found myself like i definitely don't remember as much of the conversation and, and, the, and so <laughs> really, like you you really start to think about like how fortunate are we to be at tables with people like Mike Chu and having these, you know, in-depth conversations and everything else. And I'm sure, it, you know, we're being changed from the inside out when we're having powerful conversations, et cetera. Sure. Just the fact that it's not as clear to me, like an entire, you know, two or three hour dinner, if you're having three or four drinks versus, you know, being clear headed, that's mm -hmm. what I've really been sitting with and thinking, you know, just kind of those thought processes. And I wouldn't say that, you know, <laughs> I, I've definitely not committed to, to, to not, being a drinker or anything, but I like, I'm just starting to think about all that. And man, we got one shot at this and that's where my head goes with all of it. And I just yeah. I feel like I'm leaving a lot on the table when, when, yeah. uh, you know, with what's the point. Yeah. And on the flip side, it's funny. Cause I had the belief at one point of, yeah, but I'm not going to have the same level of connection with people without the drinking. Like I believed alcohol made people more fun or connected us and things like that. And if, you know, if any, anyone listening kind of has thought that before, at least the decision I made is that I remember telling my friends this, when I stopped drinking, nothing is changing about how I'm going to be in social events other than what's in my cup. Like I'm going to be as intentional. I want to be as playful. I want to be as connected. Um, the only thing that's changing is what's in my cup. And when I made that decision, and it took probably six months for me to get clear on that after I stopped drinking. But when I made that decision that I have the power within me to walk into a dinner or walk into a party and be present, be fun. I don't need alcohol to bring that out within me. Um, it re-solidified that decision for, for me. So, yeah. The first time that I did 75 hard, which I'm not a huge fan of anymore sure. again, but, but that's the thing that I struggled with because we had some things coming up and I was looking for 75 days on the calendar where, you yeah. know, kind of yeah. around events and everything. And it's just like our, our lives. Are kind of yeah. And one of, that was my number one concern was like, how am I going to go to this person's birthday party and have fun? And that was my first time of like toying with it. And I wouldn't say I've arrived, but the one thing that I'll share with you, um, this last month has been insane for us, um, mm. moving mm. a new house. Like I, I had to move out uh, before, cause we had two back-to-back -back masterminds. Dylan and I did a Lake Powell mastermind with some fathers yeah. and sons. And I was literally on the road for like two weeks. I, um, I moved out of our house. We got movers, put everything in storage. And then I went to Lake Powell for a week and well, actually it was like 10 days. Cause Dylan and I are there on the front end getting it ready. And then afterwards I, we cleaned up and then I flew to Miami for the couple's mastermind. But the point that I was making with all of this, I looked at Kara and I said, you know, I don't know if I could have done this month. I would have made it. But I don't know if I could have done this month if I'm I'm glad that, you know, she had committed to doing some 30 day sprints. I'm like, I'm going to join you. 
And honestly, I'm really glad that I did, Mike, not only because we were, you know, with fathers and sons, and then we did the couples mastermind, et cetera. I think I was much more present and clear headed, but honestly, I think I might be a disaster or a train wreck right now. Just having come back a couple of days ago from, from, you know, that three or four weeks, I, I, I feel it. Like energetically, emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I own a peak performance uh, company for, for entrepreneurs and I think 75 hard is, you know, I, I, you didn't really ask this, but I just felt the need to check. I, I think 75 hard is great as far as like stretching one's capacity, doing hard things. It's a great mindset uh, thing. And then we're not a fan of it. Like you said, is when someone's really trying to transform their health, their life, et cetera, I believe in what we call our champ dev sustainability quiz and any strategy and programming that we give our clients, it needs to be able to answer three questions under the banner. If you can't see yourself doing it for a decade, don't do it for a day. Mm. And that's basically, um, do you see yourself, do you see, do you see yourself being able to enjoy it? Whatever nutrition, fitness, like, could you see yourself finding a way to enjoy it? Does it actually fit within your lifestyle? And could you see yourself, number three, doing it for extended periods of time? And most people would not say they enjoy 75 hard and they definitely don't say they could see themselves doing it for extended periods of time. And so I love it for like stretching our mental capacity, but actually transforming one's physical and mental and emotional being. Um, I think it can do, I think it can do more harm than good. In fact, I don't even think I've seen it do more harm than good where clients have come to me saying, I tried 75 hard and I've done this and now I've actually put more weight on and now I'm actually more stuck and I'm feeling more defeated. I thought 75 hard was going to be the answer. And so this isn't to knock 75 hard. I actually mm -hmm. love Andy Purcell. I have first form supplements in, in my pantry. This is to say if anyone's watching right now and wants to like take their, their weight, their health, their physique, their energy to the next level, really think about that concept of if I can't see myself doing it for a decade, uh, don't commit to it for a day when it comes to really wanting to change one's life. So I just felt the need to chime in on that. No, and I love that. I love that framework. The one thing that 75 hard did, for, by the way, you probably couldn't convince me to do 75 hard again, because oh, like, like you said, it's it's extreme. And But the one thing that it did do for me, and I, I think you know people are in different spots, but I think I was kind of in a rut. Hmm. It showed me, you know, when I'm committed to working out twice a day, like it really yeah. afterwards... Um, when I did that for 75 days straight, when I, when I have an excuse that I can't work out three days yeah. a week or four days, I proved to myself that that was all just excuses. And so yeah, that's yeah. The thing that I think, you know, it did do for me a little bit, but I agree with you in the sense that there was no real lasting consistent change other than that was the one, Mike, there's no, like if you, if you can work out two times a day <laughs> for 75 days, there's, there, you got to stop with the excuses that you don't have time to work out once yeah. a day or, you know, three times a week or four. So um, I, but I agree with you and I've, I've heard a lot of people really say, so I have a question on, you know, if you can't see yourself doing it for a decade back to your, your philosophy there, is that just in personal habits or do you bring that into business as well? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I use that as a concept called our champ to have sustainability quiz specifically for health, but one might argue that it's relevant, especially in the early stages of people's careers one might argue that it's relevant in a lot of ways and don't get caught up in the nuance of it. Like maybe it's not a decade, but maybe it's more like people are looking for fast cash. Mm. And mm. oftentimes that's what actually causes them to lose money yeah. instead of like, no, I would stay in this investment for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. So I don't care if it goes up and down during the recession, whatever right now. Um, so it could apply in so many different areas of our life. I think, I think it's a matter of context. One of the things I've noticed in being in the coaching world and, everything like that. I think too many people focus on the content mm. without focusing on how it fits within the context. And so they just, <laughs> they hear an Instagram reel. They see Alex Ramosi everywhere. And they go, oh, it's really good. And Alex got amazing stuff. But I think at the end of the day, as human beings who take ownership for everything that we have in our life, I think it's important to consume content and mm. see where it fits within context. Sequence, for example, Timing wise, this might not be a piece of content that I should be focused on because I'm still in the startup phase of my business or I'm well beyond that or whatever it is. So a little more detailed answer to your question, but yeah, I think it applies to a lot of different areas of life with the right context. I love it. Well, we're definitely, I, I don't want to be assumptive here, but I'm going to ask you question number two. And, and we're, <laughs> I mean, we're almost, we're, we're 30 minutes in. So you which I think is really good. I'm not one of those. That's like, we got to get through all four questions, but where I'm being assumptive is 
Um, I'm going to assume that I'm going to need you to come back and we're going to finish this in another episode. I would love it. I would love it. Cool. Well, let's jump on to the second question. So what was your greatest setback and what did you learn from it? Oh, man. I remember the person who connected us, uh, Sterling, when we met at that dinner and jokingly about your father's son mastermind. If you remember that dinner, I was like, Ayala, is your son Dylan? And I'd already been following your son on Instagram before we even met you. So jokingly, I'm going to have to like rent a son to be able to come to your guys' mastermind one day. I have two girls, but I need to rent a son to come to your guys' mastermind. Yeah. Um, Sterling said something to me once. Um, he goes, you don't have to talk about it. He like said it kind of jokingly, but he's like, you don't have to talk about your setback so often you know, when you meet people. And to one extent, I wanted to be cautious when he said that of, do I harp on it too much? And then the other sense, I like to really make sure that my setbacks uh, are lessons that I've really learned from. And I'm never scared to share it with other people in a way that we oftentimes think that everybody else has their ish together, stuff together. And mm -hmm. we're the only one that's gone through those things. But more times than not, what's most personal for us is actually most universal. Yeah. Someone struggling with thinking they're not good enough or feeling overwhelmed or too much on their plate. Um, so I kind of just preface that because I probably could, you know, make a whole list yeah. of, of things that uh, have been challenging for me. But the, the two the two biggest setbacks for me professionally and personally, one uh, was after 11 years of being at the same business and in the same industry, uh, pivoting on a dime and switching uh, careers and went from, you know, whatever multiple six figures in income to making $28,000 over the next eight months. And, and, and of course, I left for that opportunity with big vision of thinking I was going to make all this money and everything like that. And I went through a period of time where I really questioned if I was ever going to be successful again. I remember crying on my bathroom floor after about 12 months of going at this new business, just feeling like nothing was going to break. Nothing. We weren't going to get traction anywhere. And it was a Tuesday afternoon and uh, I just, it was midday and I was still crying on my bathroom floor, unable to go uh, to work. That setback though taught me so much that A, most new ventures we're going to take on are going to be harder than we expect, mm. but not more than I can handle. I had a friend say that to me the other day, and it really resonated with what I think the biggest lesson is uh, from that period of time. That it's going to be almost always Grant Cardone in the 10X rule. Expect it to be more time, more resources, with more setbacks than you're expecting. And new ventures are oftentimes going to be harder than we expect, more than we expect, but not more than I can handle. And we ended up figuring it out, right? Like, most people, again, my patience and my process, most people were quitting, giving up after a year. And we went on to be a part of the number one sales team in the company, uh, as an example, after a year of making $28,000 after making multiple six figures for years on end uh, before that. So professionally, uh, that was one of my biggest setbacks. And then, um, but the, the, the setback that I think really has been most transformational was uh, a couple of years back. Uh, realizing that I was in a life that was chosen. Mm. What's the best way to say this? Um, that I was in a life that was chosen by what I thought everybody else and what society said would make me happy. Mm. Uh, as an oldest son of an Asian family, whether it was rooted people pleaser within me, wanting to do what like my aunts and uncles and ancestors had always said uh, would be right. And I just found myself in a small town in a relationship I knew I was not wanting to be in, doing work that was not fulfilling and um, made a tough decision to actually pursue my heart. And that shed a lot of identities and grieving. I moved, um, got into a, like the relationship that I have today, started a new business. But during that process, there was so much guilt and shame about who I was choosing to be instead. And I, I had a a, a somatic therapist say to me one time, guilt is I'm embarrassed by what I did, mm. which I had some embarrassment about the things I was doing, but shame is not loving who you are. And I remember the biggest lesson from that setback was doing all of the inner work and deep work and emotional work of fully loving and owning who I am. And making the choices that are best for my fulfillment and happiness in a way that allows me to serve the world better too. So the biggest setback was five-ish plus years ago, sitting in New Jersey, realizing that I believed, I wholeheartedly believed, Mike, that my best days were behind me. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. That's a really low place to be when you're in your young 30s, thinking that the best of your life was behind you, professionally, personally, everything. Um, I don't believe that today. I don't believe that anymore. I have all the hope and possibility that amazing things are ahead. But there were some dark, dark times uh, during that period of time where I even sat at church questioning if God would still love me um, because I had been divorced. My parents kicked me out of the house, for example, when I went to stay with them for a night after that process. So professionally was the moving businesses, but personally was this like just this season of drama, it felt like, but it led to the led to the man I am today. You know, it's interesting because I've I've actually had a lot of conversations with um, you know, people that have broken out of that. Um, you know, I I think I think I've shed some molds myself, but I I feel like it's kind of like an outlier thing. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's, you know, maybe it's because it's just so hard to break out of it. But do you have any practical any practical advice around that as you've kind of like broken that down and like because I think there's a lot of people that just feel stuck and you know you said a life that was designed for you and I think the problem is is sometimes you know we go down this road and I kind of I say this all the time but like I kind of feel like the system is rigged to kind of take us like cattle through a chute sure Um, but you know I think most people are stuck and I think I think the people that really have an awakening and get to that point generally fight through it, but got any practical advice around that? Hmm. Practical advice. I put as you far as tan- yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, well, this is more of like a principle or a concept first that I think can help someone identify some actual like tactical or tangible advice. And that is we aren't wired to be successful. Mm. Like when we really get to the core of, how we're wired as human beings. We're not wired to be successful. We're wired to be loved. Mm. We're wired to fit in. We're pack animals by nature, right? So for example, I was making decisions in my late twenties and early thirties that would cause me to fit in and be loved by the pack that I had grown up with based on the conditions. And so this is kind of tactical and a hack and it might not sound tactical at the same time. And that is make sure intentionally that the circle of influence, the people you're surrounding yourself with are living by design the life that you actually and truly desire, yeah. whether it's how they raise their kids, whether it's the, the the way their marriage or relationships are, whether it's the fun things that they do or don't do, whether it's how much money they make, whether it's how they use their money, whatever it is, because we will internally as human beings find ways to be accepted and loved by the pack that we're spending the most time with. Mm -hmm. which will in turn cause our focus to go, I should start a business too. I should get into real estate too. I should, whatever it is. And so uh, the tactical advice was getting out of an environment and out of a circle that wasn't aligned with the life that I really wanted to live. I came down here to Austin X number of years ago and really was more intentional about the circle I had. It's a tactical hack, if you really think about it, is understanding how we're wired as human beings and then setting yourself up for success by putting the people and circles around you uh, that almost cause a forcing function to, to do those things. The second tactical one though, Mike, is I walked into a therapist's office four-ish years ago, right on the tail end of that uh, dark season. And having been someone who d- had done a lot of personal growth, personal growth to me had been like reading John Maxwell books, Uh, going to Tony Robbins conferences. So I had this ego about all the personal growth stuff I had done. And I viewed therapy as this like secondary, like something's got to be wrong with you type of thing. (laughs) And so I want to share this because the second tactical thing that has been game changing for me over these last four to five years and truly loving the life that I live. And most importantly, being at peace with who I am was somatic therapy, somatic coaching, not talk therapy, Mm-hmm. But somatic therapy, which is addresses your nervous system, which addresses your emotional state, which addresses your past traumas and your reparenting and your childhood stuff. That's the second tactical thing um, that I was doing during this process. So those are my two answers. Circle of influence, somatic coaching. So good, man. So good. I'm glad I asked the question at first. I was like, yeah. but you know, as you were saying that my dad always says, um, if man built it, I can deconstruct it and fix it which I've, Mm -hmm. I've, this has just stuck with me for years. And as you're saying that, like I was hearing him say that, but you know, he was always talking about equipment and, you know, right. 
But as you were saying that, that's why I love doing this because I realized as you were, you know, talking about that, like you look at that circle and and that cage that you're in and you want to break out of it and, you know, getting out of that, whether it's real estate or whatever it is, you, you're in that, you wake up and you find like, man, all, this is all we talk about all day, every day, whatever it is. And as you're breaking out of that, like, I just had this revelation because like, I think I've come become pretty, and this is why I like talking with people like you, because my dad always said, if man built it, I can deconstruct it and sure. I can fix it. But if another man is doing it and I'm inspired by it, mm. I can deconstruct that. And then I can also do that. And I love that. That, that was the first time that it kind of clicked for me. My love dad's saying, but you know, it was more about practical equipment and stuff, but sure. it's the same thing with humans. It, and, and whether it's modeling the success of someone else, like you said, and then deconstructing it. And really four or five years ago, when I went down this journey, I have used the phrase multiple times over the last couple of years. I reinvented myself. Like I reinvented this mofo. You know, I've said a lot over the last couple of years. And to the quote that your dad said, it's like I deconstructed everything about who I was, my beliefs, what I thought I wanted, how I thought I had to act and operate um, and allowed myself to put it all back together to be the, the man I wanted to be and I'm continuing to want to become. So I, yeah, I relate to that for sure. Man, this is so good. I'm going to be cognizant of your time. So I want to give you an opportunity because, you know, I'm sure at this point in time, our listeners are just, you know, extremely inspired. I'm always inspired with you. Um, tell us a little bit about Champ Dev and your businesses and 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 what you guys do. Yeah, I mean, we have two main offerings or, or wings of what our company does. We have uh, the Health and Wealth Academy, which for me, uh, I had built a seven-figure business. I grew up a 10-time national karate champion. So being in shape was always important to me. And here I found myself having made all the money in my mid-20s and felt like I was 45 at 25. Mm. And it was the least proud I had ever been of my body. So I really went on a journey to figure out how can I get into the best shape of my life and grow great businesses. And that kind of led to what the Health and Wealth Academy is today, which is very specifically designed for busy leaders, entrepreneurs, et cetera, and how to win with their health, wealth, and happiness through their mental health, physical health, and emotional health. Um, so that's what we focus on, how to help people get into the best shape of their lives permanently in a way that directly impacts all the other areas of their life. Um, and then we have our Passion to Profits and LTV Accelerator offerings, which is for consultants and coaches and course creators. You know, uh, the, the real thing we specialize in is we help uh, course creators and coaches unlock $250,000 to a million dollars plus um, in what we call hidden pockets of profit, like business that is already sitting there without having to generate more leads, without having to spend more money on marketing, without having to put more effort into marketing um, by unlocking what we call the LTV accelerator. So that's uh, that's what we do on that side of, of uh, Champ Dev. You know, I love it. And, and I don't, we, we haven't even talked about this either, but I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on social media. People wouldn't believe that, but you know, I'm kind of intentional. For I try sure. to be more of a creator than I am a consumer, but for, I get so inspired by watching your posts. Uh, and <laughs> never talked about this, but you know, you're like, Hey, give it up for Lynn. She just did this. And I'm always like, go Lynn, because um, it's just exciting and it's fun yeah. to watch. And, and, and so I can, you know, just say from an outside perspective, I actually know some of your clients too, that, you know, have just, I mean, they swore by your process and, and, and again, I'm just such a huge fan of you that, uh, um, I, I love it. Yeah. I appreciate awesome. that. Well, it goes back to, um, my first, first like exposure to business being selling Cutco. You probably have had other Cutco people as guests. I'm guessing, I think I saw Justin Donald on here, et cetera, stuff like that. And I remember a, a mentor manager said to me, it's fun to sell your first set of knives. It's a whole nother feeling to help someone else mm. sell their first set of knives when they didn't believe it. And, you know, it feels similar to that and what we get to do uh, over there is I built my own very successful coaching business, but watching people do it for the first time themselves and what it creates in their lives, whether it's profit or lifestyle, that's why I put those, it's one of the reasons I put those celebration posts up because it still feels just as exciting to me today, 20 years after being in business as when I was 22 doing the Cutco biz and helping someone uh, sell their first set of knives. So it's always fun being able to mentor someone to succeed and break through in an area that maybe they didn't believe possible. Yeah. So you call it L L LTV? What, what the LTV call? accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's it. that's very that's very built on the fact that Jay Abraham says there's only three ways to increase revenue, mm. right? Get more front end clients, 
get people to pay more, like their average order, or get clients to stay longer and pay more often. At least in the industry of coaches, courses, consultants, and everything like that, the online marketing world seems to be so heavily dominant on just get more front end clients, mm -hmm. right? Click funnels, paid ads, and everything like that. And it's not that that's not important. That's just one of the three legs of the tripod. Um, but I've been able to build a very sustainable business that's also very highly profitable without a lot of ad spend, uh, because at least in our industry, most 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 companies keep clients for av on average three to four months, mm. and we keep clients on average for three to four years, um, and so it helps people just unlock these. It extends clients LTV in a way that builds their business to be more predictable, sustainable, and scalable. I'm going to, I'm going to shift on you for just a second and then I'll let you go, but only if you promise to come back and answer the other two questions. <laughs> I promise. I promise. I, I would genuinely love to. Okay, cool. What, what are you, I mean, right now is such a chaotic time. You know, I'm doing a webinar next week, um, you know, just investing in, in certainty and uncertain times. There's so much, you know, just turmoil and chaos in the world. What keeps you anchored? What has you excited? I, I know that one of the reasons why I love being with you is because I'm just always refreshed. Mm. And I, I know everything's not perfect in your world. Everything's sure. not perfect in my world. But what are you excited about? Like, let's let's talk about some some things that are refreshing and, and what you see as an optimist about the future. Yeah. Well, you spoke to our mastermind a couple of weeks ago. And one of the most, one of the most commonly repeated phrases uh, over the last 30 to 60 days actually comes from you. So I'll just start with that one. And that is, I heard there's this thing of, called a recession going on. I'm just choosing not to participate. Yeah. Um, and so as far as just like a mindset side of why I'm excited moving forward, that has been the most commonly repeated phrase uh, over the last month or two. So thank you for instilling that into our community. Mm -hmm. um, things, things that I'm excited about, anytime I feel like seasons are low, mm -hmm. I have at least probably three to four different times in my career now, whether it was 08, whether it was 01 and stuff like that. Um, it's during those times of period, it's during those periods of time that I like to expand my time horizon, expand my vision. Um, so I don't get caught up in the short-term things. And so uh, long-term, I got really inspired in my business and what it would look like to build the most transformational coaching community on the planet mm. for uh, online coaches, et cetera, that, Developed champions to know their greatest love, abundance, and glory. And so that means a lot to me. It might not mean a lot to people yet, but um, the first thing that gets me excited is like just a bigger vision more than just like, we got to find a way to grow revenue yeah. uh, or something like that. So tied to a deeper uh, vision. And then secondly, is that opportunities. I know this sounds stereotypical to what a lot of people hear in the investment world. Is that like when the economy is down, more opportunities are available, but not even just the investment side. I also believe the business side. I think down times will reveal who the up people are, mm. right? Um, like that's what will flush out yeah. the the entrepreneurs who didn't have what it took or never really had passion for the industry they were really in. They were in it just for a paycheck when the tide was high. Yeah. Um, so that gets me excited because I know the type of person I am, bring the whole conversation full circle, right? At six years old, I was able to stay committed to getting my next belt when most six-year-olds were quitting. Mm -hmm. So I know who I am as a human being. And when we wake up from whatever happens with our economy over the next one, two or three years, uh, my I believe my business will be positioned to capitalize and thrive in ways even bigger than we've been able to up until this point. A, because the, the economy will flush out who wasn't meant to be there. And B, we're choosing to think bigger picture uh, during a downtime and planning and preparing through all of that for the future. So that gets me uh, excited on our personal side. We're going to get married next year in Hawaii. Um, so it's so excited about that and uh, continuing to pour into experiences and relationships has just been a big focus on me for the last couple of years. And so on a personal side, uh, I'm excited about those things. Yeah. I just, I just love your whole little family unit. It's just, you guys, I make them excited to just see where all that goes. And and honestly, yeah. and I don't, I don't say this passively. Um, if I had to, you know, pick a top 10 list of people that I'm watching, um, you, you'd be on that list. Um, wow. when I talk about deconstructing, because just, just your whole life, you know, uh, a guy named rock Thomas from, uh, he was, you know, part of go abundance and started M1. He always talks about being a whole life millionaire mm -hmm. and 
you know, from that perspective of deconstruction, you're, you're, you'd be in my top 10 people to watch just from that perspective, because, you know, there's people that I watch business wise, there's people that I watch, you know, a marriage wise, parenting wise, there's, you know, I have mentors in all these areas, but when you find someone that you can watch kind of, and I, again, I know Mike Chu would say, you know, I'm far from, I get that you're far from perfect, but if there's a whole life round person that I'm watching, you're on that list. And so um, I'm, I'm excited to know you. I'm excited to be part of it. And <laughs> I have a mentor, you were, you were talking about flushing the system, flushing things out. I have a mentor that used to say every healthy body has a bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he that was is true. Yeah. He Maybe was two or three. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and he was talking about those seasons and those times that you're talking about. And I've just never forgotten that because it's such a great way to say it. And um, yeah, so I, I appreciate you just kind of reframing that. And and I'll say one last thing. Your group coming in and speaking to your mastermind, um, you know, we show up and we bring energy. But when that room is full of people that are passionate and energetic and they're pulling and they're drawn, I haven't had I haven't spoken to a room like that for a while. So well, well done. Um, you know, it's a lot what you've done. So. I'll close out with this one thought and the whole life millionaire, I'm assuming this is what you're referring to, but it, it really does mean a lot that you say that because uh, on the health and wealth Academy side of our company, we, um, the mission of what we want people to create identity wise there is to become a CD three champion, we call it. And CD three is referring to winning with your health, wealth, and happiness. And a common friend of both of ours, John Vroman was my very first coach in my early twenties. And I wanted to move to Hawaii. I also wanted to keep growing my business in New Jersey. And I was so torn, early 20s, da, da, da. And I remember he asked me this question. He said, why does it have to be or? Why can't it be and? And that concept of and versus or has changed the way I think about life. And he said, why can't you create a world where it feels like you live in Hawaii and have a growing business in New Jersey? And just that question got me to think differently about what kind of business do I have to create in a way that I could disappear to Hawaii for two, three, four weeks at an end. And I was able to end up creating that. And I ended up having both. Whereas at one point I thought I could only have one or the other. And so then I, when I got in my later twenties and in my thirties, I said, why do I have to have a good relationship or a good business or be in shape or rich? Why can't I have great health, wealth, and happiness. I'm assuming that's what you mean by whole life millionaire. And yeah. um, so it does mean a lot that you say that because that's been a that's a big part of my identity and a big part of what I do. So thank you. Amazing. And it's amazing that you've figured it out. And it's amazing that you're teaching others to do that because I think it's huge. So um, where can people go to find you? Yeah. Um, my my social media is the easiest way. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Mike two underscores Chew or Facebook Michael Chew. If you do run a coaching business, of course, blah, blah, you can go to www.champdev.com backslash free. And we have all types of free trainings and resources on how to grow your business. Um, and then the last one is if you want to, if you're a busy leader who just wants to increase your energy, get into great shape in a way that directly impacts your sex life, relationships, business, leadership, et cetera. Uh, we have a free Facebook community. It's kind of a cheesy tagline, but I still stick with, even though my marketing team says to change it. Uh, it's called Six Packs and Seven Figures on Facebook. It's a free community that we do free challenges, free trainings. I think we're going to do a uh, an accountability group in November around either no porn, no alcohol, no smoking, no something. Um, we, don't, we do just things to bring the community together for free in that group. So that's called Six Packs and Seven Figures on Facebook. So bunch of different ways. Hopefully you'll, you'll find, you'll find me somewhere. I love it. You had me at sex. So I'm, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Exactly. Come into the group. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take you up on your offer or my request and we'll bring you back and, and we'll dive into the, the, uh, the other questions at some point. I can't wait. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me.